Who are your favorite preachers and teachers in the church? Can these heroes of the faith become quasi substitutes for Jesus himself? Can we go so far as to idolize men and create teams and factions in the church instead of relying solely on the scriptures? We would never allow that to happen, would we? We'll be talking about that and much more with Kurt Allen, Kurt Kennedy, on today's Theology on Air. Well, thanks for joining us on uh, for Theology on Air, an outgrowth of Theology on Tap, uh, which is a ministry here in Houston where we gather young adults around craft beer to have theological conversations, usually in person every other month. These days, virtually every month, really, because every month we do a, every other month we do a themed get together and then an ask me anything in the other month. So, but this is our weekly show where we can look at all the topics we can't possibly hit during theology on tap time, and so we call it Theology on Air. So I'm Evan McClanahan. I'm the pastor at First Lutheran here in Houston. I'm joined uh, by Sarah Stone, as always, uh, Outreach Coordinator for Young Adults at Memorial Drive Presbyterian Church. Yes. Outreach Director. It's good enough, yeah. Okay, okay. She does awesome outreach with young adults, so. Uh, and as I said, Kurt Kennedy, and uh, he's, uh, he's with us. He is a pastor, photographer, rapper. We were just talking about a uh, how one of his uh, songs is in a museum because he was able to rap about the Heidelberg Catechism. So I'd like to see you do that, okay? But we're going to be talking about platform epistemology today. Uh, so those are kind of two big words. So Kurt, why don't we just start by defining platform epistemology? Or Sarah, did you want to first say, no, you, you wanted to say no, how you I got Kurt to come to, on again. I wanted to... Uh tell all the people that were listening before and wanted Kurt to come back, we listened to you because uh, they were like, what are we going to hear from that Kurt guy again? He was so cool. Someone said Kurt for president uh, after they listened to you last time. So now this is so ironic because you're going to be talking about how people idolize leaders and, and maybe you are one for our listeners. But um, yeah, if you have something you're passionate about, this is all I did. I contacted Kurt and I was like, hey, you want to come back on? We pay nothing. And uh, you can talk about anything you want to, and this is what he wanted to talk about. So tell us a little bit about what this is and why it interests you. So <clears throat> the term platform epistemology, or epistemology is sort of a, um, a name I came up with as, and it's not new, right? So I, I'll explain in a second. It's not a new idea. It's just, I just coined it this way because we tend to think people we're always looking for people who are blessed by god or hearing from god and we tend to think people who have bigger social media platforms than us so bigger churches or have written a lot of books and these are people we go to conferences sometimes just to hear this speaker and wait in long lines to you know whatever it is we just tend to think like these people are closer to the lord than us and in a social media age like ours what happens is we look to them as sort of almost like prophets, like they're hearing from God. And if that's my guy, whatever he says, I agree with. And we don't always, to the point where we don't even hold these people accountable uh, until a scandal happens. Like case in point, Jerry Falwell Jr., right? Mm -hmm. This scandal happens and now all of a sudden, people are remembering things they saw years ago that they overlooked that never happened and all this stuff is starting to happen. And, and so it's like, there's this sense where we're wired, I think, as people to kind of look to someone who's the blessed people. And it's even biblical. In, in, in when Jesus told the disciples, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than the rich to be saved. Peter was like, well, then who then can be saved? Mm -hmm. Because when they heard that, they thought, well, the rich people are definitely blessed by God. And Jesus just flipped that over and said, those are the people who are not coming into the kingdom. And they were like, wait a minute. <laughs> so hold on, you know. So I think it's just in our nature to think that you got the first Corinthians three, I'm with Paul, I'm with Apollo, so I'm with Peter, this, this sense of I'm, I'm affiliated with him, I'm with Jesus. And, it, and Paul was just like, look, I can't save you. I, he said, I'm not, I did I die on the cross for mm -hmm. you? This says I'm paraphrasing. That's the <laughs> Kurt, Kurt Kennedy translation. Yeah. See, well, and then there's that whole thing like, well, I think I baptized a few people. No, and then maybe there's a few others or something. Yeah, right. Yeah, because yeah, it's it, like he didn't want to even there be a confusion there. So, mm -hmm. yeah. No. And, and so I think there is this sense where in our day and age, people's platform 
to to people who don't have the bigger platforms equals wisdom, which is epistemology mm -hmm. is what is the study of wisdom. And so this this idea comes from wow, and I'm watching this play out. Just like wow, people are really listening to these people, that, and a lot of the fighting, even over the racial stuff, even over the stuff we talked about last time I was on, a lot of that is connected to these people are saying this and that's my guy and I stand with him. He knows the Bible. I've benefited from his teaching. And then these people are saying this and that, and it's just like, boom. And I, it'd be nice if we could just get back to old Acts 17 and just be Bereans and actually open the scriptures, look and be like, does this make sense here? Not what he says, but what does it say here? Amen. I just think it's a lost art. You're making Evan very happy by mentioning the Bereans, by the way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My, uh, the other day I was like, okay, children, who are the Bereans? What do they do? Why were they so great? And they're like, and I was like, I think it's in Acts 16, but of course I was wrong. It was Acts 17. So they read a whole <laughs> chapter for nothing. <laughs> well, no, it wasn't for nothing. Like you still right, sure. reading, God, but yeah. God's word didn't come back void, right? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, one of the things that, I mean, I struggle with this because we're right now on Facebook Live. We will put this on YouTube and we have a podcast. Like, I've, and I've always struggled with this as long as I've done this kind of radio show or whatever. But um, as Christians, and I think especially as Christians leader, like modesty is very important, but we live in a self-promotional age. So I've, mm -hmm. I've, 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 I've basically done things like this and I've virtually never marketed them. I mean, I have a whole podcast I don't even tell people about. Why do I do that? Not this one, another one. And y'all didn't even know that because I never told, I never tell anyone about it. You'd have to like really dig onto like our church website to know it. Um, and um, so it's, I, I wonder like at some point, if some of the more famous people should be like, yeah, I mean, I'm getting a little bit too big for my britches here. Quit making such a big deal of me, you know, like focus on Jesus. But I don't tend to hear that very much. No, I mean, so here's the, the challenge, right, with what you're talking about. There is a stewardship reality, right? So like mm -hmm. if I, so I, I've written a couple books. I, you know, I don't want, what I don't do is I don't put like my sermons on Facebook. Like, hey, uh, I think that's that's going a little too far for me. But like mm -hmm. as, a, as someone who has artistic ventures, like a podcast, like I'm working on the new album called Reporting Live. Like my music always talks about what's happening in the culture. Like I go, my music mm -hmm. goes directly at, if you find, if you find any of my last three albums, they talk directly at the culture. I think there is a, a degree in which to, for stewardship purposes, we do want, we do think we have something that is beneficial for the body. So I'm not against self-promotion because I think what I'm talking about will be beneficial to the believer. That's, yeah. so I don't have a problem with a guy promoting his book, wanting people to, you know, tweet it or whatever. I'm fine with that. I think when it becomes a problem is when, as you said, no one is leading, like reminding people, hey, like, like remember when in Acts 10, when Peter walks in to Cornelius and them and they start to like, they almost like worship. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm just a man. Like, get up. Don't, I'm not, don't worship. I'm just here. I'm just a messenger. Like the, the Lord sent me to tell you this. There's a sense where you see this happen at different times in the scripture. It's like, whoa, 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 don't, don't get up. Like, like a lot of these guys know you have influence. You know, like if you say this, you know that people are going to respond and be like, whoa, he said this. It's like a very popular theologian recently said, you can't, no true Christian can vote Democrat. Like you cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat. And he started to say why. So the, and I understand what he's saying when you list a democratic platform. And then I saw all these people start all of a sudden now, everyone who's, who's his, that's their guy. They're all saying this, right? Here's the problem with a statement like that. There's no such thing as a true Christian and a fake Christian that both are saved, right? So when you say no true Christian can vote Democrat, what you're saying is anyone who votes Democrat is not a Christian. Mm -hmm. If a person is not a Christian, then that means they're not saved. If a person is not saved, then by implication, they don't know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, by implication, when you see him, he's going to tell you, depart from me, I never knew you, which means you're going to hell. So by implication, what this theologian is saying is that anyone who votes for a Democrat is going to hell. 
But those same people will say the men who own slaves are true believers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this guy could have been beating, doing anything to people that's totally against the Bible, but the person who happens to press this button on Super Tuesday has, has forfeited their salvation. Now, people say, no, that's not what he meant, but that's what he said. You can't separate those two. Those kinds of statements are dangerous because in this culture, everyone's ready to fight and defend and go after this, that, and the third and pick apart what this man said and this person said. And, and I think when you say things like that, this is dangerous. I could see you saying, I just think it's unwise based on some of their platform to vote. Okay, fine, say that. But yeah. when you say you're not a Christian, no true Christian will vote, you're basically saying if I vote all the other sins, though, people will be forgiven of. Jesus said this, every sin, whether it's against me or anyone, will be forgiven. <clears throat> the only sin that won't be is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So now you have to theologically prove to me that voting Democrat is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And that's a problem. Yeah. But I mean, people don't make that, they don't think deeply enough that way because we're not Bereans. We take what people say and then we run with it and tweet it, retweet it and stand behind it and defend it and don't realize, wait a minute, mm -hmm. I, just, I just said, I agree with, people will go to hell if they vote. I just do not think that's true at all. I think that's adding to the gospel and that's dangerous. Yeah. That is not what saves us. So you just said, um, well, I was, I was gonna ask, do you think it's more of a problem because, well, Christians are a little bit lazy, that may not be anything new, but we'd kind of rather someone else carry the weight of biblical interpretation. You know, we'd, be, we'd basically be like, well, Tim Keller, he seems really smart. 3,000 people go to his church in Manhattan where they hate Christians, so he must really know what he's doing. I get a little tired of the uh, Tim Keller uh, references all the time, being an inner city pastor myself, because <clears throat> everyone's like, oh, we'll just do what Tim Keller did. And, like 3,000 people show up. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, so I'm not a Tim Keller fanboy. But anyway, but people are like, well, Tim Keller said blah, 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 blah. It's like, well, okay. And anyway, so I don't, do you think that's part of the issue is that people are just happy to be like, well, he seems like he knows what he's doing and he said that, so that must be a good interpretation. Sure. I mean, I, th I think so. I think we, I think we like to, I think we like to live vicariously through other people's faith. Right, like people, people who, who do things, who you know, we we love the prayer warriors and stuff like that, right? Because they just do things. We love the stories of the evangelists who goes to Tim Keller's to go to New York City and have a church of thousands. You know, we love that stuff because sometimes, if we're honest, I think I mean this isn't church, right? We're all believers. Let's talk honest for a second. If we're honest, a lot of this is more due to the lack of confidence we have in our own conversion the mm. lack of confidence we have in the way God views us. And, we, and, and so, or we're disappointed that we don't have some of these platforms or that we don't, or we don't have the gifts to have these. And so a lot of it, I think, boils down to like, man, my, my, my confidence in the Lord is a little shaken. So I, I, I love seeing someone else who the Lord seems to be blessing, answering their prayers, giving them wisdom, because it's not me. I think that's part of it. I think a lot of it is we're just insecure as as believers a lot of us and we're afraid of things like like i know many christians who are afraid of that matthew 7 21 depart from me i never knew you because mm -hmm. because you don't really study what jesus is actually saying in that verse and and leading up to that point so then we're just like uh and so i think a lot of us are just really we are we're disappointed at where we are and so we celebrate seeing grace in other people and that's not a bad thing in and of itself but this is why we like aff affirmation from people who become famous you know all of a sudden kanye west is a christian and everyone's flipping out now part of it is just wow we're excited at this genuine conversion but there's this sense of we want affirmation mm -hmm. from the world too we want affirmation to know we're okay because we believe in jesus like i'm okay and like we don't get our affirmation that way I don't necessarily get my affirmation from my internal sense. I don't get my affirmation even from my obedience. I get my affirmation from what the scriptures actually say about people who profess to believe in Jesus. That's Second Peter 1. He gives us these very great and precious promises that, that help us with, with, to live a godly life in this life. And that's, but that's hard. It's hard to believe what this word says 
So I, I'm excited about what this person's doing because God's actually blessing them. Look at their ministry. But if we evaluate the platforms that people have, then are, are, are is Joel Osteen a genuine believer? Then he's got 40,000 people in his church. What about Creflo Dollar and all these other people who we're not, we, I, I don't think these people are genuine people, but you know, I just, I have questions based on what I know of their theology. They have two bigger churches than some of these other folks, right? So what are we talking about? So I just feel like some of us need to just like really actually work mm -hmm. to believe the scriptures that tell us who we are. And then we don't have to worry about who, what everybody else is doing. So I'm not saying, look, I'm, I've been encouraged by guys. I'm friends with a lot of guys. I've made friendships with a lot of guys who would be considered big dogs. And I don't, I, so what? Okay, if you want to name drop. Yeah, I could. I've now I've been to people's oh, homes. I'm, I'm, when, I got some buddies. When I asked him about somebody in particular, I made a joke when we were texting. And he's like, oh, he's my friend. I was like, oh, well, do mention our podcast. No, but yeah. here's, here's what I, I keep thinking is there are some parts of the Bible that are hard to understand at sure. first pass, for, especially if you don't have any kind of schooling in it. So people have to, at some point, find someone that they trust a trusted pastor. I mean, I grew up, my dad was my pastor and he's a pretty stand-up guy. He's not perfect, but he's pretty trustworthy. And so I would go to him and say, what does this weird passage mean when it says blah, blah, blah? He would explain it. And because I trusted him implicitly, because he was my dad, I was like, oh, that must be what it means. And I think that's what happens is people find someone that they've at least found some trustworthiness in, and then they just keep trusting them, which is lovely on one hand, but of course, yeah. then people can change and they can be not trustworthy or they can be trustworthy on some things and not other things like how do you even know who to trust because no one understands the whole bible so you know? that's a that's a great point i think that does happen I've, I've felt that way at different times but here's the question that we have to ask ourselves if we're a christian and we go to a church do we trust tim keller more than our own pastor hmm. do i trust john MacArthur more than my own pastor if you do, then you shouldn't be at your pastor's church. Go move and go to that church because that's the problem. Mm. We'll trust platform epistemologians more than our own leaders. We'll, we'll, we'll love to hear their sermons and go to conferences and buy their books. And yet we don't go to our own pastors. The, the men who labor, who will actually pray for you, who will meet with you. You can't get a meeting with any of these guys. Mm. You can't email these guys and they'll email you back. Most of them at a conference are gonna have some measure of security and you might not even be able to walk up to them and just encourage them and thank them for, I mean, so again, it's not so much that it's bad to say, hey, these guys have helped me understand some things. That's, that's okay. I mean, we give honor where honors do, right? We outdo one another in showing honor. That's Romans 12. The question is how much honor are we giving these people? And I think as a pastor, I don't want people in my church coming up and saying, Hey, I've been listening to such and such a sermons here. Tell me what you think. I want you to, it's like, nah, I mean, then I would, I, I'm not going to be offended, but I just like, well, then maybe you should consider going to his church or now streaming his messages. Listen, the Lord gives a lot of grace. There's a lot of people who are sharp that just don't get the chance to write a book. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of rappers whom you've never heard of that can spit. There's a lot of basketball players who never make it to the NBA that are amazing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people you know, how come we, we talk about the goat a lot, right? The goat, the good. Who's the goat of helping people get through the tough times? We don't, we know, we don't know who that is. Who's the goat of heart surgery? Who's the goat of helping people? You know what I'm saying? We don't. Evan, do you know that? <laughs> do you know that term goat? Yes. Greatest of all time. Greatest of all time. Yeah. yeah. Just making sure. Cause sometimes, sometimes we have to help Evan with these things. But you said you're in the city. You better know the goat. So, yeah. 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 I know, right. I know that's the one pop culture reference I know. And Mount Rushmore, too. I know that. I know that right. people just prefer to Mount Rushmore. Right. So, again, I just think, sure, I think, yeah, I've read a lot of books. I mean, I remember, I'll say this one. I remember when John Piper and them invited me to rap at his church. And so I, this was 2006. I go there. At the time, my name was Voice. My rap name was Voice. I'm there. I'm having pizza in John Piper's house. Chuck Stedham is worship leaders there. I'm there with my two, G two DJs. His daughter, Talitha, is there. I think his sons weren't, his wife was there. Noel was there. And we're all just eating and talking. I'm like, man, I'm in John Piper's house right now. And then, you know, his house is about a mile down the road. So we go down there. He introduces me. I do a concert. He's like, are you ready? And I said, Pastor John, this is your church. Are you ready? Like, I'm, I do. And we became friends. Like, we see each other at because a lot happened. That, that, 
that I did a song called Unstoppable at his church and it went somewhat viral for back then. And there was all this pushback from fundamentalists. How could John Piper have a Christian, ra Christian rap at his church and blah, blah, blah. And then it was, and then it was all this dialogue and I was getting interviews and Christianity, all this stuff. It helped people understand why wow, reform rap is real. It opened the doors in that way. And I was one of those people who did that. And I became friends with him. I, I loved him. Jerry Bridges was a great friend of mine. Like Jerry Bridges, I used to have dinner with him every year. He'd come into my area to teach at the pastor's college. And we would have, like, I love, Jerry Bridges was my guy, man. He was a solid brother. I loved that dude, right? But like, I didn't, I didn't want to hear him preach more than my pastor though. Hmm. You know, I wasn't, I've always respected John Piper. And, but I don't want to hear his, me and there are messages that he's taught that have affected me deeply. But I'm not trying to listen to John Piper more than my, my guy though. This guy knows me knows my life. And I think if I put other guys above him, then their platform epistemologists to me. I don't think that's what the Lord intended. And that's, that's mm -hmm. Peter's, that's Paul's point. Who am I? Mm -hmm. You know, the, he who plants and he who waters is nothing, but God causes the growth, right? That's first mm -hmm. Corinthians three, seven. It's like at, at best people plant, people water, but God causes the growth. So let's worship God ultimately. But we respect our pastors. Hebrews 13, submit to your leaders for they have watch over your souls. Tim Keller doesn't have watch over my soul. Mm -hmm. You know, John Piper, yeah. even though he, he doesn't have watch over my soul. The BD is one of my friends. He doesn't have watch over my soul. You know, so that's the stuff I mean. I also think about, you know, don't let the you know, left hand know what the right hand is doing. And I wonder if, I mean, it's one thing if you're a great teacher and it's sort of unavoidable that, you know, people are going to push you. You know, if you're John Piper, like you're going to end up writing books. If you're John MacArthur, you're going to mm -hmm. end up doing that. You know, I mean, whatever, you're a 10 talent person, you know. I'm not a 10 talent person. They're a 10 talent person. They should, okay, if, they, if they're lifted up, that's fine. But there's, there are other ways that people kind of build platforms, not kind of from the bottom up, having done, say, 10 years of in the trenches Bible study or whatever. But say they, you know, I'm not going to name names, but let's say they do street ministry at Planned Parenthood. Or they, uh, and they, they get some, you know, pro-choicers who are like with the rainbow vest, like defending Planned Parenthood. And man, that makes good TV fodder right there. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a viewable YouTube, you know, argument for 20 minutes. I, I could watch or they'll do um, ministry to the cults, you know, Mormonism or whatever. And they end up talking to people on the sidewalk and having conversations. That's, that's definitely clickable too. I, Oh, what did this Christian say to that Mormon? Woo. That's interesting. But the people watching it have no intention or plan to actually go do ev evangelism. Mm -mm. So what, what are they watching for? Mm -hmm. If you're saying you're, you're videoing it so that like, you know, like you could show other people or inspire other people, give other people like tactics on how to like talk to cults or people at Planned Parenthood. Okay. What percentage of the 80,000 people that watched that video went down to the Planned Parenthood where they live and had a similar conversation, you know? So I worry about, first of all, engaging unbelievers in video meant for like YouTube distribution. Yeah. They're in a public place. Like it's legal. Is it right? I don't know. Um, and then I think about, are you using those unbelievers who have bad arguments, who haven't thought through what they believe, even who are doing wicked things, that's fine. But are you kind of using them, you know, like to, uh, to build up your own ministry? I, I don't know what the right answer is to that. But to me, that's kind of a different way of building a platform from just like being a 10 talent Christian and, and writing books because you're building up the body. You know what I mean? And I, I, I don't, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on the rightness of that. I mean, the, the challenge with that is like, everything is a motive issue, right? Like God knows yeah. the heart of men. So like, bro, I, I don't know if you out there, you know, it, it, Jesus, I think said it best. When you said, don't, you know, don't let your left hand know what it's doing. He said, when you fast, don't look like you're fasting, right? Mm -hmm. Clean yourself up, look good. Because if you do, then that's your reward. So I tend to not work. I, I tend not to judge people who do that. Like, I, it could be useful. It could be giving people courage to do the same. It could be selfish ambition. You know, Paul in, in Philippians 1 said, look, some people preach out of envy because I'm in chains. Mm -hmm. Some people preach... Paul said, what do I care? The gospel's being preached. So if your motive is wrong, but the gospel's being preached, I'm with it. So what? You, the, the Lord will let you know if that reward is burned up or if you got a nice little addition, little, little sunroom to your home in heaven. Like, okay, cool. Let the Lord sort that out. Uh, so I don't really get into the motive of people. 
sometimes those videos are entertaining and they're helpful, but I would agree. I think a lot of us, again, it just goes back to we live vicariously through people. Like faithfulness, like God has no stepchildren, no grandchildren. Like you're a son or a daughter, like it's you mm -hmm. and you, you are not going to give an account for agreeing what, what Ravi Zacharias said in this, in this, in this video. You are not going to give an account for what Ray Comfort did in this video. You're going to give an account for what you said and did. You know, you're not going to, I mean, even, even when we, you know, teach as a, as a, as a person who teaches almost week in and week out, even that, I don't measure faithfulness by like, man, is everybody, I measure faithfulness by what did the scriptures say? Where's our church? And did I communicate the truth of this passage to our church and give people an opportunity? If no one does anything, then I don't measure faithfulness by that. Now I'd be disappointed. I might have to be like, hold on, man. I might need to step my game up. But I think there's a degree in which all of this stuff is motive driven. Mm -hmm. and so we don't know people's motives. And so, but what I can say is we judge a tree by the fruit that it bears though, right? So we don't gotta pretend like we, we're allowed to make some distinctions. And I think when you see people I'm more worried about people who say things that are reckless mm -hmm. or that talk with a certain bravado and air that I think is arrogance or that say things that create things that are not the fruit of the spirit. Mm -hmm. Like in like, like one example that's really been a big deal since the last time we talked in June, you've seen it. I've seen this really develop. Like the con, the biblical ethic of love has been redefined. Like love now is basically either to be tough or or or, or contentious. Like that's sort of what a lot of the people are doing, and especially in the sort of social gospel versus biblical gospel, all this stuff. There's a bunch of back and forth that really is. You know, you look at Matthew five. Jesus said, if you say to your, if you insult your brother, if you say you fool, you know, rocker you are liable to go to hell, right? I see that all day mm. on Twitter. And, and people say stuff like this. Well, that's the most loving thing you could do is correct error. Or, or do, that's not what Jesus said <laughs> in John mm. 15. Jesus said the most loving thing anyone can do is to lay down his life for his friends. Mm. He didn't say nothing about the most loving thing you can do is, is bust somebody's head because you disagree with them. So, but again, these guys think like, there's like this John Wayne like bravado, especially among evangelicals and white evangelicals that have these platforms, just had this bravado, like you tough. And it's like, fam, the Lord was, was the most manly men of all. And the Lord was able to cry and weep, even though he knew he was going to raise John the Baptist from the dead. I mean, John, John I mean, uh, uh, Lazarus from the dead. Yeah. He, the Lord was able to be sensitive when, when, when Martha was all affected and upset. And Lord, remember when Mary Martha and Martha's fixing stuff and then she gets upset and she said, the first thing she says is, Lord, don't you care? Like, you don't even care about me. I'm, can, tell Mary to help me. You know, he doesn't say, Martha, you're complaining. You're judging your sister. Nah, he doesn't do that. He speaks to the heart issue. He cares. He's like, Martha, you're, you're, you're anxious about many things. But he speaks to the real issue because there's love there. There's a lovelessness that is so pervasive right now in the church and it's been redefined to be like this tough love. Mm -hmm. Like Jesus flipped over tables once, fam. That wasn't the way, <laughs> that wasn't his normal display. And dudes act like, and, and we're never told to flip over tables to imitate Jesus in that way. So there's a sense where these platform epistemologists have redefined humility, have redefined love, and a lot of believers are just following along with them, insulting your brother. Like, I mean, People think, listen, grace is not that amazing. Let me say this. Grace is not so amazing that you can do whatever you want and there'd be no consequences for it. Like grace never lowers the standard of holiness. It just forgives us for not meeting it. But it never lowers the standard. Like when Jesus said in Matthew 6, after he taught them how to pray, he said, look, if you don't forgive others their trespasses, neither will God forgive you yours. So don't think because you profess to believe in Jesus that like it's sweet, like you still got to actually live the way Jesus said live, even if that goes against your platform epistemologian. Like, just because this tough guy says this doesn't mean you got to back that up. And that's what I think about, like, Christians who support Trump. It's like, listen, if you're a Republican and you vote Republican because you're conservative and that's what you're going to vote for, fine. You don't care if it's, if it's, if, if Pusty McMichaels is the, is the Republican nominee, that's who you're voting for, right? 
that's fine. But don't defend the character of a person because that's the platform on which you have. It's okay to say this dude's character is off, really off. And I, he says stuff that is ignorant, uh, I, but, but this is the platform in which I vote. I'm a conservative. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But when you defend the people, that's the problem. It's like we can't redefine love and redefine humility and redefine these things. And our platform epistemologians, they help us do it because we listen to them and we think, yeah, stick it to them. You ever watch these Ben Shapiro eviscerates social justice warrior or watch he demolishes this mm -hmm. or Candace Owens destroys. And we and these are the videos we share with other people. Like, look at this. What are we doing? Like, that's the, what you want to represent you? You're going to stand before the Lord and be like, man, I was proud that they destroyed them. Mm -hmm. Man, Jesus said, look, these people have been taken captive to do the devil's will. So the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. That's 2 Timothy 2. So again, this is the stuff I see. And I'm just like, man, you dudes are, are, are comedy. This is comedy if I'm being the most gracious. And this is dangerous if I'm being the most biblical. Because people are just like, love is like all tough. And it's like, who wants to be treated like that? So Kurt, I have a question for you. Well, I have many questions for you, but the first is like, so one, what do we do when some of these uh, platform, how are you saying epistemologian? Yeah. I like that, I like that. Platform epistemologians are saying things that are actually wrong and false. And we feel like they're leading other people astray. And it's funny that you're talking about them being hard sort of brash because I find sometimes that they're teaching like a new kind of tolerance that actually swings too far the opposite way. So mm -hmm. regardless, if they're saying something that's wrong, really like goes against what the Bible says on any pick a topic, what are we supposed to do if it's not to like correct? I'm curious. Well, well so again, we have to understand the context in which you're asking that question, right? So is it if so, if what someone says is affecting people in my church, mm -hmm. then I'm going to instruct people in my church. Okay. Okay. If you're not affecting people in my church, I don't care what you say. Now, I may critique ideas. Mm -hmm. I don't like to critique people. I'm only using people today to make a point. I typically will not name a lot of names, but sometimes it's helpful for people to understand what I mean. Yeah. by saying names. That's the reason why I'm using names today. But like I critique ideas, but not people because that person professes to be a brother. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be a person who is slandering or, 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 or talking down to someone who's a brother that the Lord will handle that because I might not even have a relationship with this person. Mm -hmm. I can't, I don't know Tim Keller. That's not one of the guys I know. So if I disagree with him, I'm not going to go on my social media platform <laughs> Yeah. And, and and highlight what he said so that people can be like, oh, he's going to talk about Tim Calvin. Let me click here and see what he's talking yeah. about. And then you dig in. It's like there's proverbs for that, you know, where you just talk about the, the gossip and the morsel of gossip and just the desire. That's just we have to understand that even as believers, we're still drawn to that edgy. Mm -hmm. That's why Mark Driscoll was so popular. Yep. Especially among drama. white people. Like, we like drama. You like, loved it. That you loved the tuck. See, black people, we've been we always tough. So when I heard Mark Driscoll, I was like, man, that white boy ain't saying nothing and we don't say all the time. But, <laughs> but I, I remember my friends who were white, they loved him. He was edgy. Mm -hmm. He'd tell you, man, you're you living in your mama's house plant. He would just go at you. And then look what happens. Look at the fruit of that ministry, right? So again, we have to not, we get excited about sort of the John Wayne-ness of these things, but we have to say one. First of all, is it affecting me personally? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking as a pastor, is it affecting me? Or does it affect my community? Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, I don't really need to say nothing. Now, if you're asking me what I think, I'll tell you what I think and why I think it's unhelpful. Yeah. Now, if you now if you say something that I see like causing division, like I mean, this is like like when 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 Dude said uh, you can't be a Christian and vote Democrat. To me, that's causing division. So our podcast last week was, let's talk about that. Is that true? Can you vote Democrat and be a Christian based on the platform of LGBT, abortion, all that stuff? Can you do that? We talked about it. And I ended with the, the implication I said earlier. This is what you mean when you say that. I do not think, even if you think it's not wise, that's different. You still yeah. cannot say that you're not a Christian if you do that. That's dangerous. When stuff like that happens, I feel a certain obligation because there are people who do look to me and want my perspective on these things, I will address some of them. But I don't sit around and I'm not trying to build a platform, right? 
where I'm just talking about what other people say and do. If you're not affecting my church, then man, you do you. So I don't feel the need to address everything again, but I will say things to people that I think are affected by this. And then, and I'll disagree. If someone asks me my opinion, I'll be honest with them. Yeah. I don't think I'm obligated to do more than that. Like this, this Facebook is not my church. Twitter is not my church. Mm -hmm. So just because I have a lot of followers, I have what 12,000 plus followers on Instagram. They're not my church. It's my photography Instagram. Yeah. They're not my church. Like I don't care what nothing, this stuff doesn't, but when it affects my church then I feel like a sense of responsibility. Yeah. Evan, you're on mute. Thank you. Apologies. Yeah. My phone keeps ringing some, for some reason, so I had to mute myself. Okay, but one of, the, one of the things that seems like a kind of danger of hitching your wagon to a person is that they can change. Mm. Um, I will name a name. Sure. How about Francis Chan, all right? Mm. Um, you know, everyone loved his crazy love book, which I think was, I haven't read it, but from what I understand, it's basically like, you know, the gospel, you know, like God became flesh yeah. or something like that. I mean, that's crazy love. Yeah. But he had a really cool title and a good a good wardrobe so i mean it sold like hotcakes but now he's kind of teaching some odd things i mean and um so it's like if you hit your wagon to a person it's like it makes it that much harder if they change mm -hmm. you know and like then you have to decide are you going to change with them or are you going to now have to oppose them mm -hmm. and so it's like you haven't been strengthening your own discernment bible muscles or whatever you know your bible reading muscles you've just been letting this guy say these really good things and you just kind of went along but but like you detect changes i mean i would say i mean i'll name a name i'll, I'll pick on tim keller again um i mean i know a lot of people who would you know like conservative presbyterians because he's pca and they would be like oh man he's a conservative like he's like and then like after time like the more he talked that's kind of been called into question now, maybe inappropriately so, uh, because he might just be speaking on the right side of justice. But that's up for debate, maybe. But uh, anyway, I, I, I don't know. I mean, one of, the, one of our questions for you really is, um, how, how does this impact the church? And I, I think we've, we've talked about that. But uh, it seems like that would be one of the dangers or one of the difficulties is that, you know, the people that you're really hanging on to there's no guarantee they're going to be saying the same thing tomorrow. Well, and I'll add to that, um, and, and this is another name drop, but that it'll show sort of my heart and how long it took me to sort of let go of this idol maybe was I loved Rob Bell and I loved watching some of his videos and I learned things from him that I then went and taught to my Bible study. This was back in the day. Um, and so when he started saying some questionable things, I did everything I could to rationalize it. I'm like, well, I think what he means is, and maybe this and maybe that, until it was like, oh, and then it was, it was painful to sort of, you know, let that go. And I think, yeah. I just want to say, break up with Rob. people have gotten lazy, right? It's also that they've made a connection with someone that they trust that has, like, in some ways, really drawn them closer to the Lord. And so then when that person maybe takes it too far, it's, it's a wound, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. You had to break up with Rob. I did. Yeah. I've had to break up with a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, which, and, and that's real. And that's in the Christian culture we live in. That's a part of it. That's a part of the culture we live in. We have, we celebritize. Mm -hmm. Christianity is an industry in America, right? So it's not just a faith. It's not just it's an industry. It's, it's music, it's preaching, it's books, it's all kind of podcasts. It's, it's an industry. It's not just a faith. And we have to recognize the cultural expression that ran. When I was in India for a few weeks, uh, a couple different times doing ministry, it was so different there that when I came back from India, I was appalled. I, I, the transition coming home the first time was way harder than the transition going there. And it was because I'd gotten so used to just a simplistic way. It was Christianity was really about the way you live over there. Over here, it's a, it's an industry that tries to get you to be bought into sort of its vision. So it's like, it's authors, it's musicians, it's, you know, that's why, and, and, and you know what, this is what you see. You see a lot of these bands now 
lead singers of these Christian bands coming out denying the faith now. Mm -hmm. Like these people, they just, because it's an industry and they, and they love the platform. And so they'll play if it makes them money, if it gives them influence and all of that. And then at some point they come to grips with, I don't really believe this stuff. And I'm just kind of, they've made their money, they've had their influence and whatever they've done. And now they're just done. And it's like, okay, that's, that's, that's the culture that we live in. We have to understand that's what we live in. We live in the Christian industry culture. It's not just a faith. It's more than that. It's, it's a brand. And because of that, we have to just be careful that we don't mix the brand with our faith. Like I'm a belief, I'm a Christian because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And I read my Bible and I do things in order to honor the Lord because of that. But then there's a brand. It doesn't mean I can't respect the brand, but I have to be careful to not advocate for the brand. Hmm. Like that's not, Jesus doesn't need that from us. <laughs> He's God. He is not sitting there thinking, man, I hope they write more books, sing more <laughs> songs and and do more right he doesn't need that from us if all books uh, ecclesiastes said no more books need to be written i think that's ecclesiastes nine think of how many books have been written since then like i mean it's just like i guess we're not listening to that dude so i think there's a sense where jesus doesn't need us to brand him he just is saying be faithful to him mm -hmm. and that faithfulness is our responsibility to make, here's what I will say. If you don't see any error in the, your guy, then it's idolatry. Mm -hmm. If all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that means your political party has, that means your platform epistemologian has, that means if you don't see any error mm -hmm. ever, and I mean, now it could be you're not around him, I get that, but there's a lot of guys who say enough things in the public that, that contradict scripture or that twisted enough, then I think it could be idolatry for you. I think we should all be able to say, it doesn't matter if you vote Republican, Democrat, whatever, you should be nonpartisan on some level, right? There's a sense where Republicans or Democrats do not have Christ crucified as their platform. Hmm. None of them have that. There is, God is not a, a, an American. He's not a Republican. He's not conservative. He's not an evangelical. He's none of that. So, I think we have to recognize, okay, I believe what I believe because of what this book says, not because of what Tim Keller's book says, or because of what John MacArthur's book says, or because of what Francis Chan's book says, or what Eric Mason's book says. I believe what I believe because of what this book says. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that that tethers us and we're willing to be honest. I don't mean we shouldn't respect people. I think you should respect people when they, but to a degree. But if I can't say anything negative about this person and what they've said, it may be idolatry for me. I may be blind to my respect for this person. And I don't think we should be that way at all, at all. I think it's dangerous to think like that. I asked the last question, Sarah, so. Uh, no, I talked about breaking there. up with Rob Bell, but that's fine. So then Kurt, what is the, what is the to do? So if you look to your guy and you think he's flawless, you've got idolatry happening, but then there's also nothing wrong in like, there's, there's someone out in Portland that I listen to sometimes because I think he puts things in a different way that makes it more accessible. I'm not able to move to Portland, right? I'm a single mom mm -hmm. raising my kids in Houston. Like I can't just move and go to another church. I work at a church. So I listen to him, but I don't think I idolize him. What's, what's my like to-do list? If you were to say like, Hey Sarah, here's what you need to be doing in this realm or people that fall into this, like, Am I, do I need to be listening to fewer podcasts? Do I need to just make sure I'm in my Bible more than I'm anywhere else? Like what's kind of the prescription? I think a couple things. I, I things. I think we should always evaluate like what fruit of the spirit is produced by the people that I respect, right? So we should, oh, we should be willing to say that, like what, and, and accurately, like not just what, like I think fruits of the spirit, right, are not hidden. They're not things that should, that's why it's called fruit, right? Yeah. We're not talking about juices and berries, right? We're talking about actual attributes that are seen in people. So it does, if, if, what is the fruit of the spirit in my life by this person's perspective? So if I'm arguing with people online 
because I agree with him versus the guy you who's your platform epistemologian, and, and I'm and I'm insulted. Then the fruit of the spirit in my life is not fruit. It's it's we should always be asking ourselves, what fruit of the spirit is this? What fruit? Is so I think one. I think two. My, what I'm saying is not like don't respect people and don't listen. I just think we have to be careful and recognize our propensity to be driven to respect and honor people to a fault, we need to be willing to say, hey, we have to be careful here. So if I can't find things I disagree with about the guy that I respect or the woman that I respect, it could be idolatry. But that might not necessarily be that. But if I'm defending what this person is saying and offended when other people don't agree with, that's sinful then. So I think a lot of it boils down to fruit. What fruit is it producing? In my life, like I don't defend like Thabiti's a friend of mine, right? We, we're, our churches are not even that far apart. He's not far from me, but he's a guy that gets attacked a lot, okay? And there are times I agree with what he's saying, and there are times I don't. But I don't attack people who are attacking him because he's my friend. I just think, you know what? He's a brother. I know he's a brother. I know he knows the gospel, and I think you're going to answer for that, you know? You're going to answer for attacking him, and he'll answer if he attacked. That's, I'm a, by God's grace, I think I'm mature enough to be like, that guy's my friend, but I'm not going to attack somebody who, who doesn't agree with him or who's attacking him. Mm -hmm. I may shake my head as I read it. Um, I think I did ask one guy. I just said, hey, bro, let me ask you a question. I feel like you, you attack woke theology and stuff all the time, and you throw people in, in this, under the bus of woke theology and all of this stuff. And how do you feel like that honors the Lord to do that? Like what, why, how do you, and we went back and forth a little bit and then eventually, and I, you know, I don't know him personally, but we know each other through media, social media. So I just eventually said, all right, well, I said, we went back and forth. It was cordial. I just said, well, bro, take it for what it's worth. I think this is an idol for you, bro. I think every, almost every post I read from you, every tweet is just mocking people who you disagree with on the issue of justice. And I just think that there's room to say they're, we're probably all wrong on some level. Yeah. It's yeah. not like, I'm sorry, but like uh, the non, the, the anti-social justice side has some wisdom in it, but they're not all right about everything. I mean, when you, so what I should have done on, with us is give you a history of evangelicalism. That's what I should have done. Because when you look at the history of evangelicalism and you talk about like a Carl, Carl Henry, right? This was a big dog with with, with uh, Harold Ockengay and Billy Graham, they sort of broke away from the modern fundamentalism of their day mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of became neo-evangelicals where the fundamentalists were moving away from the culture. After the Scopes Monkey trial, the, the evolutionary debates, evolution versus creation debates, the, the church won in the courtroom, but it lost in the public opinion. Mm -hmm. So you had fundamentalists were now moving away from engaging with the culture, which obviously because slavery and Jim Crow existed, they'd already done that anyway. But even more so that was happening. You got guys like uh, Billy Graham, Carl Henry and Harold Ockengay. I mean, these guys started Christianity Today, World Vision, the National Association of Evangelicals, trying to bring a different perspective. And so fundamentalists and evangelicals kind of argued with each other. And Carl Henry, who many of those guys, the guys who signed the statement against social justice, many of them would see Carl Henry as a hero to them. I have his book that's called, it's right here. I've been I'm reading, this is fascinating to me. This is called The Uneasy Conscience of Modern Fundamentalism. Mm. I cannot believe I've never come across this book. Mm. Let me just read a brief excerpt. This is written in 1947. This is Carl Henry's critique of fundamentalism. Here's what he says. I'm just going to give you a snippet. Okay. This is Kurt's reading moment. <laughs> he says this. Yes, the rejection of non-solutions does not involve, at least logically, a loss of the social relevance of the gospel. A globe-changing passion certainly characterized the early church. However, much it, however much it thought within a redemptive pattern centering in Christ's substitutionary death and bodily resurrection. Had it not been so, Christianity would not have been the religion of the then known world within three centuries. Some sort of a world passion had made the Christian message pertinent enough 
for rulers to want to bring their subjects to it. A Christianity without a passion to turn the world upside down is not reflective of apostolic Christianity. Consequently, modern fundamentalism is wondering by what peculiar manipulation of circumstances the great tradition has seemingly lost its world relevance. For evangelicalism has cautiously avoided any alignment with non-evangelical groups, yet has failed to develop the broad social implications of its message. So his point is this, and there's other, what he's saying is this, evangelicals, the fundamentalists of his day, he's saying that they have so removed themselves from engaging with the social ills of the world that they've lost their saltiness, is basically what he's saying. Mm -hmm. And this is 1947. One more small snippet that would make the point. He's giving a, a perspective about fundamentalist clergymen of the day. This is what he says. The situation even has a darker side. The great majority of fundamentalist clergymen during the past generation of world disintegration became increasingly less vocal about social evils. Mm -hmm. It was unusual to find a conservative preacher occupied at length with world ills. In, in a company of more than 100 representative evangelical pastors, the writer proposed the following question. How many of you during the past six months have preached a sermon devoted in large part to a condemnation of such social evils as aggressive warfare, racial hatred, and intolerance, liquor traffic, exploitation of labor and management, or the like? A sermon containing not merely an incidental or illustrative reference, but directed mainly against such evils and proposing the framework in which you think the solution is possible. So he's basically saying, how many of you are teaching against these things and not just using them as an illustration, but a sermon devoted to their being wrong and proposing a solution based out of the scriptures? And here's what he says the answer was. Not a single hand was raised in response. Now this situation is not characteristic only of one particular denominational group of fundamentalists, rather, a predominant trait in the most in most fundamentalist preaching is this reluctance to come to grips with social evils. This is 1947. This is the same thing that the people who are called woke have been saying. You guys don't care about these issues. But now it's called woke. Back then it was called communism. It was now it's Marxism. It was it's all the same stuff. So like these platform epistemologians Many of them are called evangelicals. They're just fundamentalist separatists in, in reality, in their application. They don't care about the social world, and so you combat it. If, you're, if your platform, if your guy is always talking about the world, the world is this, and they're going after this, and it's that, 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says, look, what am I to do with judging outsiders? He said, God judges the outside. Hmm. Purge the evil from among you. Paul's like, I didn't say don't associate with the idolaters, the sexual morality, the swindlers. And the, I, he said, I didn't mean the world because then you'd have to leave the world. I said, don't associate with people who profess to be believers. So when you see this, this theology of the world being the enemy and it's the left or the conservative right, that's unbiblical perspective. God says, look, the devil is taking non-believers, whether they, whatever their political ideology is, the captive to do his will. And so we have to say, hey, listen, God said the way out is to love these folks and be faithful to tell them the truth, but not in a way that's contentious or insulting them because of what they believe. And that's where we can see, wow, we've strayed far away. But in, in many ways, a lot of the Christianity that we call evangelical that's even reformed is basically the same thing. It's 73 years later, Carl Henry's, this critique is basically a, prof a prophecy of 2020. Hmm. 19, I couldn't, when I read this, I, was, I mean, this whole book is highlighted. I was like, and this guy isn't a social justice warrior. This is a dude that a lot of these guys would respect. He's one of the fathers of even modern evangelicalism. And even he's saying, you guys don't care about people. You don't care about the ills of the culture. You're combative. You're theologically conservative, but culturally combative. Hmm. And you, we need people to be theologically conservative, but culturally compassionate. This is the mission field. No, we got to. So, so this is why I think all this stuff is just like, wow, it's the same idol, just a different altar. Yeah. It's just the same thing. It's just like, wow, this is, this is the same thing. So it just has a different name, different faces, different players, same thing. So let me ask one last question. I'm sure Evan has something else too, before we wrap up. But when you were reading that little snippet, what I kept thinking was, 
Christians feel very differently about pastors getting up in with their own congregation and talking about things that are even like politics adjacent, right? Mm -hmm. No one wants to hear a pastor get up and say, here's who you should vote for. Mm -hmm. Like that makes us cringe. Um, but even to talk about sort of political issues and whether any of the ones that you listed, I mean, of course, everybody's talking about racism now because it's very, I mean, it's and vogue a moment. What? It's and vogue. vogue. Right. So how do you feel about pastors getting up and using their own small platform, their podium, their pulpit to speak to some of these things? Cause it could get dicey fast. So I, th I think, a pastor has a responsibility to shepherd his people. Yeah. And sometimes you got to shepherd your people through the political landscape. I don't, I don't think the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say what topics are off limits. Hmm. It's like, we can't always talk about things that are out there, right? Mm -hmm. Pastors cannot teach as if the, everything's out there. We can't talk about sin as if in the grand scheme of don't do these. It might be happening in my church. I, I need to, I, I, I saw what you posted online and then you post it online and I'm not, I'm not calling you out in church, but I need to acknowledge that, listen, the gospel forbids us from insulting one another. I told my church on one, one Sunday, if you're going to be angry at your brother or sister because they vote differently than you, then you're not biblically mature enough to vote. Like voting is an American construct. It's not a biblical responsibility. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a social construct. It's fine. We, that's part of our political system. Christians throughout the ages have never had the ability to vote. Hmm. Christians in the Middle East, in China, in, in, in Idlib, Syria, and they don't have the ability to vote and they still honor the Lord. Right? There are Chinese pastors who take briefcase suitcases with them when they go preach on Sunday mornings because the authorities might come in and take them and they might never come back and they're ready to go because the gospel is that real to them. So I, I don't think pastors should be restricted from being able to do that. But I don't think pastors should go in there and give a, a, a platform of what we should and shouldn't do, or at least bind people's consciences. Yeah, See, That's the danger. Like I, I think pastors have to toe the line of helping people understand what it means to be faithful, but not to bind people's consciences to one thing or another. Yeah. Now, when it's clearly sin, that's, that's different to me. Sure, sure. Man, that's a hard, that's a hard middle line to, but, but, but it's what, but we also got to believe that Jesus is fully God and fully man. How do we explain that though? <laughs> Touche. Right. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's just, listen, the Christianity is about holding intention, difficult things. Yeah. Like we don't have the, we don't know how, how what free will and sovereignty. How, how is, how did God predestination? How did he ordain everything in my life? All the stuff he knew I was going to do all of this and I'm still accountable for it. Yeah. That's what Romans 9 is, right? Who who can who can argue with God? You can't do nothing that God didn't allow you to do anyway. So what do we say about that? Paul was like, man, who are you to argue with God? You know? It's like this. So I think we have to realize we gotta hold these things in tension. We can't pretend like politics and religion is a tension that we don't hold. We gotta hold it in tension. I gotta explain to people how was Jesus fully God and fully man. It doesn't make sense, you know. It's true. It's a hard job for it's sure. It's a hard job. Well, we're just we're just about out of time. Just one last quick thought, maybe, and then we'll we'll wrap up. But yep. It, it seems like, uh, you know, a word we haven't used yet on the show, which kind of is surprising, is celebrity. Maybe we did mm. use it but it, it, early on. But it, yeah. people, people always like celebrities. And that's kind of an American thing, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, you know, from the early days of Hollywood. I mean, celebrities, I mean, we've always, we, humanity has always aspired to, you know, look at famous people and give them more credence in their work. But I think it's like at epidemic levels today. So what is a safeguard against turning men of God, women of God into celebrities? You know, I mean, is there a safeguard? And maybe just some practical advice on that, and then we'll wrap it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, this is going to sound so cliche because what Jesus said was just, it just seemed cliche, but it was just true. I, I just think, one, trust your theology, right? <laughs> so, so if you're reformed, your theology teaches it all, all, you know, total depravity, right? Like we're all capable of being in error, right? Mm -hmm. Trust your theology. Number one, remember your theology. Two, remember the scriptures. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Like, remember that. Re remember what it says about showing honor. Like it talks about who do you show honor? I'll do one another in showing honor. We, we, it's okay to do that on one level. 
Um, submit to your leaders. You, those who preach, who, who, who lead well are worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. There is a degree in which that can happen. I think, you know, we have to just evaluate ourselves and think, man, am I too captivated by this person? Like, I think markers for me are, do I care what Tim Keller says more than my pastor? Now, I happen to be that pastor, so it's different now, right? But I think I've always thought, do I care what these people say more than that? Am I more excited? Now, you get used to your pastor, and I get it. You know, you get used to this guy speaking in his conference. and I'm not saying don't, don't have respect for those things. I think if I'm drawn to believe or want to listen to these people more than the local church that God's called me to, I think I have to say, oh, I need to be careful. I don't think it's a, it's not, it's not, it's okay to say, you know what? I need to step back from social media or this for a minute. I need to not, and I would even say, you know, there's a lot, we read a lot of Christian literature. You know, it might be good to say, you know what? I'm gonna step back from reading books for the rest of the year, just the Bible. Mm -hmm. I need to just read Bible and think about Jesus. Cause one of the things I will say, and this is a different topic, maybe if I'm allowed to come on another time, another year, one of the things I think is, is a challenge in our theological framework is we kind of look to Jesus to what, who he was and what he did, but we look to Paul on how we should live. And so we forget the things that Jesus taught because Jesus taught the simple way, the simplicity of glorifying God, which was, he said, look, I said this last time I was on the show, whatever you wish others would do to you, do also to them for this is the law and the prophets. Jesus wasn't there to explain election, regeneration, the guy, he wasn't there to teach the order salutis, right? He wasn't there to teach the order salvation. He was just there to explain how you glorify God in these ways, right? Paul says, listen, I want to help you understand the theological framework of how you glorify God. So let me explain to you that you were chosen before the foundation of the world. Let me explain to you how the Holy Spirit works. Let me explain to you what justification my faith is. Let me explain to you what sanctification is. Let me he wanted to explain it, but he's not different than Jesus. But we look at Jesus, we worship who he is and what he did, but we forget about what he said. And we always look to Paul, and I think we pit the two together. So I think to keep ourselves grounded, let's read the Gospels and remember things that Jesus actually said. Like, yeah. what does it look like, the simple way to, to fill, I mean, the fill for the law of the prophets, honestly, is him saying, uh, think about what you like. Think about how you want to be treated. I want to be treated with respect. I want the benefit of the doubt. I want people to be gracious to me when I'm struggling. I want people to be there for me when I'm hurting. I don't mind being corrected, but I don't want people to be self-righteous. I don't want to be judged. I want people to remind me of truth. Then he says, take all of that and do it to others. We That's don't, a we good don't note. That. That's a good note to end on. Kurt Kennedy, where can people find you? Facebook. And what's your podcast? I want to listen to the one about... Uh, whether I can vote for a Democrat. Or yeah, not. so it's cross-examine. It's not cross-examine, not with a D. That's another guy, a theologian yeah. who has that. We're right. cross-examining. He, he has a big platform, that guy. He does, actually. He has a bigger platform. Coming after his platform. No, there you go. No, no. So yeah. ours is cross-examine. Uh, you'll see it. It looks like a, a, a urban logo. You'll see it. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's right, cool. the elements, right? Yeah, it has the element, the periodic table of elements. But it's not a real thing. It's, it's, it's in yeah. the elements. It says something, right? Yeah. So there's that. I'm on Twitter as I'm Kurt Kennedy. So I'm changing the world one tweet at a time. Uh, I'm Kurt Kennedy. Um, I'm Kurt Kennedy on Facebook. Kurt Allen is probably gets more, I probably interact more as Kurt Allen on Facebook. And then Instagram is Kurt Kennedy as well. And then on, if you want music, uh, you go to iTunes and you can download all but my latest project that was released in fe February. They're all there under Kurt Kennedy. Like you'll hear. Kurt and, and Kurt with a C. Kurt with a C, yeah, Kurt K with a C. C-U-R-T, so. Yeah, and then Kennedy like the old, the president. That's right. That's right. Cool, I like man. It. So yeah, man, appreciate you guys letting me come on and ramble and, and all that stuff. So hopefully all the Kurt for president, I will be Kanye's vice president if he allows me. <laughs> and I like that. See, that. see, that's the modesty I'm talking about right there. Yeah. The willingness to be vice president. <laughs> to be vice president. That's well, it. folks, until next time, as always, we want to encourage you to question freely, think deeply, and disagree as needed. All right, Kurt. Thanks.